you know, we look at cyberspace in a different way. We talk about cyber war, the Russians talk about information war. Если мы говорим о киберугрозе, мы в основном рассуждаем о информационной безопасности. Propaganda is a very important part of that, but it's a different kind of propaganda than what we saw in Soviet times. Because the propaganda doesn't seem to be sort of baldly arguing in favor of one ideological perspective or trying to convince everybody that the Russian perspective is correct. It instead is a form of propaganda that tends to cast doubt on the reliability of any facts or of any media source. It's saying, oh, you can't trust anybody. Definitely, there is no longer monopoly over information, over values, uh, over influences. It is not easy, and I can understand why people might be resentful. They want to, you know, put a, uh, put, put, put a limit uh, to the dissemination of information. But it is increasingly difficult, you know, if you want to get this information, I'll get it. These were another. There has been this proliferation of uh, new sources, particularly with social media and uh, the cyber environment. The real challenge here is to educate our public as to how they understand that information that comes across their screens every day. How do you determine whether this information uh, is accurate or not? How do you determine uh, whether this corresponds to reality? How do you know uh, when someone's trying to manipulate you? That's not only useful for dealing with the problems that we think we have from Russia, it's useful for dealing with the problems you're going to have day to day uh, in a society uh, where a lot of big companies, a lot of other institutions also try to manipulate your behavior. This is to me very dangerous because when people on the street lose understanding of reality, this is bad enough. When people at the top do the same, this is dangerous. What the United States has to do is to prepare for any eventuality that might involve another power, but at the same time recognize that there are a lot of other threats out there that we have to counter. And increasingly, it's not just in the physical world, it's also in the cyber world. So we have uh, different environments and, and different venues for confrontation and conflict. That includes a whole host of things. It includes cyber operations, it includes propaganda, and it includes the little green men or the polite people that landed in Crimea without anybody understanding the day that it was happening, exactly what was happening. At the 60th anniversary of NATO, I was asked to work with the new Secretary General and a group of experts to see whether a cyber attack was an Article 5 attack. Uh, that was something new. There had been an attack on the Estonian banking system. And the issue at that stage was that it was very hard to identify the origin of the attack, and therefore it was hard to say it was an Article 5 attack. But I think more and more there is a sense that we can identify where some of the things come from, but it requires saying it and not making excuses about it. There was a breakthrough in 2015 where 25 countries and the US and Russia were both the leading countries within this group. They agreed on a first very basic uh, set of rules. It says, for example, you should not allow uh, malicious actors to use your territory and your uh, cyber infrastructure to attack other countries. You should help them investigate cyber incidents. You should not be putting malicious code into IT products that are produced on your territory. You should not um, claim that somebody else hacked you in another country without uh, providing the proof for them. So very basic things. Um, but unfortunately, that's where it stopped. In 2017, the group almost fell apart. They didn't come to a consensus. They could not even agree on what they agreed on earlier. So now the work's paralyzed. <laughs>